bad. Huh? Not bad, huh? Quick change, that's my superpower. <laughs> All right. Yes, please sign up for I Love My City. Go to the website. Uh, you can email us, office at, office at newhope on 395.com if you want to still get a shirt. It's going to be a good time. And then Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday we will be at Butte Park. Uh, providing the weather is great like it is this morning. We're going to be there at 10 o'clock next week for one combined service uh, with a number of other churches in town, the churches that we're going to serve with next Saturday. And, you know, just, man, what, I, I love this because uh, I think so often as the church, we get super focused on the things that we don't agree on <laughs> and forget about all of the things that we do agree on, right? And we do agree on so many things, especially, we especially agree that God wants to reach lost people. And uh, that, is, that is what we're trying to do with I Love My City. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a moment. But uh, again, before we get into God's Word this morning, let's just take a minute. And I need to catch my breath, and I just need to pray. Can we do that? <sighs> Father, thanks for your word. God, it is your revelation to us. It is, uh, it is the picture of your character, of your heart, your desires for us. God, it communicates everything that we need to know about who you are and, and God, what you want for us and, and God, what you want to see in our lives. Uh, there's nothing like it. There's no greater truth. There's no greater power to reform a heart or to change a life than your word. So God, we just are, God, we, we, we're so grateful to be able to spend time in it. God, we live in a country where we can do it openly, that uh, we can do it uh, in this place on a morning in, in, in a building that we own. Yeah, God, it's just so good. And so this morning, we just pray that you would just move in our hearts, that God, you would teach us, that God, you would show us uh, your heart through your word today. And we pray it all in your son Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Oh, I can't tell you how good it is to, to preach to full seats, right? It's just so good. I tell you, preaching to empty seats sucks. Like it really does. <laughs> it's really tough. And, you know, even though you don't laugh at a lot of my jokes, that's okay. You know, at least I, I know they're bad then, right? Because if the seats are empty, then nobody laughs. And I don't know, you know, how do I learn, right? Yeah, so staying relevant. You know, as I get older, uh, and I know that, you know, and I've accepted the fact that I'm a middle-aged white guy, right? And that's just, that's, and I'm, can I hear it for all the middle-aged white guys this morning? Yeah, are you here? <laughs> There's a few. <laughs> all right. Uh, but I've accepted the fact, right, that I'm a 51-year-old, you know, slightly overweight white guy, right? And, um, uh, so this question about, man, staying relevant is, is always kind of on my mind, it seems like, as, as I get a little bit older. We had, a, we had an event at my house here several weeks ago. The staff was there, and uh, one of the staff uh, mentioned the name of this, this hip-hop musician. And uh, I actually had heard of this musician, and I commented, and she said, you know, you know who that is? Yeah, of course I know. I'm not dead. I'm old, but I'm not dead. What I didn't tell her is that <laughs> the only reason I knew who he was was I was doing some research for a sermon and just happened to come across one of his videos on YouTube, and, and I watched it. I'm like, this is terrible. Like, this is awful. Who listens to this stuff? Right? But, of course, I wanted to appear like I'm, you know, relevant, right? I'm, I'm, I'm hip, right? If you use the word hip, you know you're not relevant, <laughs> right? That's a sure fire sign that you are not relevant if you think you're hip, okay? Sometimes uh, I worry a little bit that the church is losing some of its relevance. Now, I'm not talking about the gospel message, right? The message about who Jesus is, about what he did for us, uh, the, the, the truth in, in Scripture, it will always be relevant, right? It is the truth, and it will never change, and it, and it is 
timeless. It will always be relevant. But I worry sometimes that, that the church and our influence on culture, that, that we're losing some of that relevancy, that we're losing some of that relevance and that influence. I'm not talking about our ability to have influence inside the walls of this, of this building, but, but when we get outside of the walls of this place, what kind of influence does the church have? You know, Jesus' final words to his disciples, right? If you remember the, the, the end of the Gospels, uh, Jesus is ascending into heaven, and what are his final words? He gives them this charge, right, to go into the world and exercise your influence and make disciples, he says. But how can we make disciples if we lack influence? I think that the greatest, the greatest tool for us as believers, as the church, to, to influence and, and to reach our culture is our ability to, to love the people around us. Amen? You've heard the saying that uh, people, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I, I believe that that is true more than ever. And if you or I or New Hope Community Church wants to be able to speak truth into our community, if we want to be able to, uh, to, to influence our community, then, then we need to understand what it takes to build that influence, what it means to, to influence those outside the walls of this building. You know, just because you have something to say doesn't mean anyone wants to listen, no matter how true what you have to say is, right? Social media has taught us that. Matthew chapter 5, and that's where we're going to be at this morning, uh, Jesus talks about the influence that his followers ought to have. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 5. This is, uh, if you've uh, followed Jesus for any time, it's a pretty familiar verse, right? Jesus is, is preaching this sermon to these people who have gathered on this hill. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And the sermon starts with the Beatitudes, and, and Jesus talks about what is someone who, who follows me, someone who's a part of my Father's kingdom, what do those people look like? And he, and he gives this list, and we call them the Beatitudes. And then in verse 13, Jesus says this. There it is. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled on by men. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So Jesus begins here in verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, right? It's, it's interesting. He doesn't, though, give us a lot of information. He, he says, you are the salt of the earth. He uses this, this metaphor, but he doesn't really talk about, like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean to be salt? Uh, but I think Jesus' followers, when they heard his words, probably understood what salt, what that meant, what that metaphor was all about, a lot better than we do. And I'll tell you this, anytime you study God's word, it, it helps if you understand uh, who, who is receiving the message that you're reading. Right? If Paul is writing a letter to, to, to the Corinthian church, it, it helps to understand like what's going on in that church at that time. What did those people hear when Paul wrote those words. And, and when Jesus said to his disciples, right, when he said to this group of people, you are the salt of the earth, I think they understood probably a little bit better 
than we might what it meant to be salt, all right? Uh, in Jesus' day, salt had a little bit different value than it does for us, right? The value of salt, especially in the ancient world, cannot be underestimated. Roman soldiers, all right? So I'm going to give you some information about salt. You are going to know more about salt than you ever thought there was to know when you leave here today. You're going to learn more about salt than you ever wanted to know, all right? Because Jesus' disciples, they understood salt, right? In, in Jesus' day, the Roman soldiers, uh, a portion of their wage came to them in salt, all right? Uh, the Latin word uh, for, for the salt that the, the Roman soldiers received was called their salarium, Right? And uh, that word came to actually uh, refer to their compensation overall, right? And, and, and how they were paid. And, and the Latin word for salt, all right? So, so the word for the, the, again, the Romans' compensation, these Roman soldiers was, the word was salarium, all right? The word for salt in Latin is sal. And our word for salary comes from the word salt, I bet you didn't know that. So you're, you're getting your, your, uh, your salt every time you get a paycheck, right? Salt was a valu valuable commodity around the world, more valuable than gold to some because uh, there was no refrigeration. Can you imagine what life would be like without your refrigerator, <laughs> right? It would be different. Can you imagine what it would be like to try and preserve food without a refrigerator. So if you wanted to preserve meat or you wanted to preserve fish or you wanted to preserve some other foods, they, they packed those foods in salt. Salt was critically important. You can't, your body cannot survive without sodium chloride. In the absence of salt, you will die. Okay, salt was very, very valuable. And, and that's why uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of spilling salt and you may or may not know, depending on your age here, right? You may have not heard, right, the this, this saying that when you spill salt, it's a bad omen, right? It's a bad sign if you spill salt. And partly that comes from the fact that it was so valuable. It's where the saying, uh, the salt of the earth, all right? It's where that came from. It came to describe a good and honest person. And if you've ever said that someone isn't worth his salt, well, that goes back to those Roman troops as they were dashing through Europe, it refers to a soldier who isn't doing enough to earn his salarium or his salt money. So if you've ever said, oh, that person, he's not worth his salt, right? That's where that saying came from. The Greeks considered salt to be divine, and the, Mos the Mosaic law required that all offerings presented by the Israelites contain salt. This is what Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13 says. Uh, as, as Moses is uh, giving uh, God's law to the Israelites, God says this, you are to season each of your grain offerings with salt. You must not omit from your grain offering the salt of the covenant with your God. You are to present salt with each of your offerings. All right, so salt, salt in the ancient world represented the permanence of a covenant. All right, the permanence of a promise. So if you remember last week, right, last week we talked about, you know, what is, what is the one thing that God really wants from you? And, and the answer to that question is, he wants you. Like more than anything, God just wants you. He wants a relationship with you. And so he, he created humanity. And then in the first parts of, of the book of Genesis, it records like these three major rebellions. So God creates humanity, but he gives them free will. He gives them free choice. And, and in their exercise of free choice and free will, they choose to rebel and to turn their backs on God. And Adam and Eve do it in the garden. Uh, it the, the rebellion culminates uh, with uh, God destroying the earth with water in the story of Noah and uh, how God saved Noah and his family. And the third rebellion was the Tower of Babel. When the descendants of Noah dis refused to spread out over the earth, they got super proud and as kind of a monument to just how awesome they were, they, they built themselves a tower. And at this point, God is like, oh, what am I going to do with these people? I can't destroy them. I promised that I wouldn't. So here's what I'm going to do. And in chapter 12 of Genesis, we see that God makes a covenant with Abraham. 
And he tells Abraham that, Abraham, I am going to be your God. And your descendants, they are going to be my people. And I am going to give you a land, and your people, your descendants, are going to dwell there, and I am going to live with them. I will be your God, and they will be my people. And, and the Bible talks about uh, the salt of the covenant, right? That, that salt represented, right? So every time the Israelites then brought an offering, all right, it had to be seasoned with salt because salt represented the, the permanence of God's promise with his people. The covenant of salt was, was a means of sealing a, an agreement between parties, uh, there was a close connection between salt and promises. When men ate together, they became friends. All right? So in, in the Arabic-speaking world, there is an expression, there is salt between us. There's another expression that says, uh, he has eaten of my salt. It's kind of a weird one. Uh, but both of, those, both of those sayings kind of represent the cementing of a friendship. Covenants were generally confirmed by sacrificial meals. Right? So if you made a deal with somebody... You know, generally you killed something and ate it together. And generally that meal included salt. Uh, covenants were generally confirmed uh, by sacrificial meals. Salt was always present as a symbol of the enduring covenant. The custom of pledging friendship and confirming a compact by eating food containing salt is still in practice today. So if you live uh, in an Arabic-speaking country, they, they still do this today. Like when you have someone to your home and uh, you share a meal, that meal includes salt, right? The Arabic word for salt is the same word for compact. It's the same word for treaty, all right? Once even his worst enemy has eaten salt or salted food with him, an Arab is bound to protect him, his guest as long as he remains. That might come in handy someday. See, I bet you didn't know that. All right, so when Jesus says, now you know a lot more about salt than you did when you came through the doors, right? So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, what is he saying? I think it would be maybe easy to read a lot of things into this. Uh, so let's not look, look, look too closely at it, but, but let's look at some of the obvious things, right? So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, all right? When Jesus says, you are, he's not talking about uh, a future event. He's not saying, you will be, or someday you will be. He says to his disciples, you are. You are the salt of the earth. And I believe one of the things that we can, we can take away from here is, is we know that, that God has chosen us. Right? God has chosen you. He says, you, you are the salt of the earth. All right, if, if, if you are a 12-year-old junior high student this morning and you're here, I want you to know if you've chosen to follow Jesus, God has chosen you. You are the salt of the earth. If you're a 22-year-old mom, all right, and you follow Jesus, God has chosen you. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. If you're a 40-year-old dad, if you're a 65-year-old grandparent, right? doesn't matter who you are. Man, if you follow Jesus, Jesus is saying to you this morning, you are the salt of the earth. God has chosen you. And here's the thing. God is not looking. God is not looking for pe perfect people. God is looking for willing people. Jesus says, you are. You are the salt of the earth. I have chosen you to be the salt of the earth. Will you be the salt of the earth? You are important. It's no accident that God has placed you in the places where you are, right? It's, 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 no, it's no accident that God has, has gathered the, the, the friends around you that you have. It's, it's, it's no accident that you have the influence that you have at work. It's no accident that God has placed you in your family. It's no accident that you are where you are. God has placed you there. He has chosen you. You are, he says, 
the salt of the earth. You have influence where you are. Now in Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah tells us about a new covenant. Right? So God establishes this covenant with, with Abraham. And he says, uh, I'm, I, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to give you this land. Right? And you're going to take this land and we're going to live there. I'm going to live with you. And you're going to obey my laws. I am going to protect you like a mother uh, bird would protect its chick. Right? There's all kinds of, of great images throughout the Old Testament of God's love for his people. So God has made this, this covenant. But, but in Jeremiah chapter 31, God says, you know what? I have a better covenant. I, I have something new that I want to do. And look what he says in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. Jeremiah says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. When I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke even though I had married them, the Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Okay, no longer will there, there be this law written on these stone tablets, right? And, and we all get this image of, of Moses coming down off the mountain with, with the Ten Commandments, right? And, and uh, uh, that's, that's what he's referring to. And no longer will, will, will the law be written on these stone tablets. Instead, it's going to be written on your hearts. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to make a new covenant, and it's going to be a better covenant. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, just a ver verse beyond where we just read. Jesus says this. He says, don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then in Luke chapter 22, and I want you to follow me here, right? Luke 22, verse 20, Jesus, when he's eating his final meal with his disciples, Right? And, and they're having the Passover meal, and, and part of the Passover meal was, was drinking uh, the cup, right? And in and, and chapter 22, verse 20 of the book of Luke, Jesus says this, in the same, it says this, In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. So Jesus was ushering in this new covenant. No longer were, were we bound to this law that was written on these stone tablets. But instead, God was going to live in us. He wasn't going to live in, in a temple somewhere. His dwelling place was going to be in us. And his law, he was going to write on our hearts. No longer would we be bound to uh, make these sacrifices, right? These animal sacrifices that, that was required. But the blood of Jesus was the once, the one and final sacrifice that would ever have to be made. Salt was the symbol of the permanence of the old covenant, but now you and I, you and I, we are the salt. Jesus says, you are the salt. And so just as salt was the, the symbol of the permanence of the old covenant, now you and I are the salt. You and I are the symbol, we are the evidence of God's enduring new covenant. Right? If, if salt, was, salt was the symbol that, that God had made this promise to, to Abraham and to his descendants, now Jesus says, you, now you're the salt, your life, my presence in you is the evidence, right? It is the testimony of my presence. Right? The, it, the old covenant, God promised that he would live in this geographic location with his people. But, but now, now God's relocated. He doesn't live in a temple. Where does he live? He lives in us. The old, the old covenant, God commanded his people to go and take possession of this land that he had given them. So they could dwell there. And so that he could dwell with them there. Okay? But God isn't interested in... In, in a geographic location. He's not interested in, in occupying a temple somewhere. He's interested in occupying the hearts of men. 
that you and I, our lives, we are, we are the salt of the covenant. We are the testimony of God's presence. Jesus says, you, you, if you're sitting here this morning and you know Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. You are the testimony of God's presence. You are the evidence that he is at work and he is, he is alive and he is expressing his one desire to live in the hearts of men, to have a relationship with his creation. He's expressing that through you and through me. You are the evidence of God's presence. You are the salt of the earth. In the same way, if you want to show the evidence of God's presence, all right, if you want the world to see that, and, and obviously this is the point that Jesus is making, right? You are the salt of the earth, right? You, your life is the evidence to, to all the people who live on the earth uh, of my new covenant, of my, of my love, my desire to live and dwell in the hearts of men. Okay, if you want to show that evidence, we must be a reflection of the light of Jesus. And that's where Jesus says in verse 14, all right, he says, not only are you the salt of the earth, but you are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Well, that's unfortunate. So in verse 14, right, Jesus says, you are, you are the light of the world. So there it is again. God has chosen you. He's chosen you to be salt, and he has chosen you to be light. This, uh, this, last, this last month, Madison and I had an opportunity uh, to do a little bit of backpacking together. And I used to do a ton of backpacking. I, I, I don't much anymore, uh, but Madison really enjoys getting out. So we took a little trip, and uh, it was great. Man, the weather was beautiful. We went up to the Strawberry Wilderness uh, area just outside of John Day, and uh, there's a couple lakes up there that are really pretty. I uh, did a little fly fishing. And uh, so the first night, right, we, we set up our tent. Uh, and we got this great little camping spot right on the lake, and uh, so partway uh, through the night, and, you know, I'm a 50-year-old guy. And so what that means for me is, like, at least once in the middle of the night, I got to get up to pee, right? It's just nobody told me that this was going to happen, but I've discovered, right? This is, this is the reality of being a middle-aged guy, right? It's, at some point, <laughs> I just don't make it through the night like I used to, right? And so... Part way through the night, uh, I wake up, and uh, I'm like, man, I can't believe I made it all the way through the night. It's, and then I realize it's still night, but it looks like day because the moon is so incredibly bright. We had set up our tent so that, like, the door to the tent, and it, and it, was, it was open, so the door to the tent uh, was like perfectly lined up with the moon. And the moon was full and the sky was perfectly clear. It was like somebody was shining a spotlight right into the tent. It was amazing. The moon was so incredibly bright. Uh, yeah, but I, of course I hadn't made it all the way through the night. It was only two in the morning. But, uh, but I was just amazed. Like you could step outside the tent and it was just like it was daytime. But here's the thing, and you, and you know this about the moon. The moon does not actually generate any light on its own, right? The, the moon doesn't actually generate any light. It only reflects light. And the light that night was not coming from the moon. It, the, the moon was just reflecting the light of the sun. Look at what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
uh, just, just a little, quick little bit of background here, right? So when, when Moses would meet with God, he, he would come away from those meetings and he would be g- literally glowing, right? His, his face would be glowing and it was so bright. People are like, man, cover that thing up. <laughs> it's uncomfortable to look at, all right? And so he would wear a veil on his face because his, his face shone so brightly from being in God's presence. And uh, so that's kind of the, the, the background to chapter 2, or 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. It's, it says, yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. And they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is spirit, and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Okay? Moses wore this veil to cover up God's glory, in essence, that, that he was reflecting. But Paul is saying, look, when someone comes to the Lord, that veil is removed, and we begin to understand and, and see the glory of the Lord. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Right? The, the, more, the more that we know Jesus, the longer that, that we walk with Him, we begin, the Holy Spirit begins to change our hearts, and we begin to reflect God's glory. Right? People, people can, can begin to see in us God's reflection, right? You are a reflection of God to the world. God's presence in you, you are the salt of the earth, right? Your life is, is the evidence of God's presence, and, and, and as your life evidences that, right, you begin to reflect God's glory and, and, and who he is. You are the light of the world. You are a reflection of God to our world. The Holy Spirit is transforming us to be better and better reflections, Paul says, of God's glory. What does it mean to, to be transformed, to reflect him more and more? It means that, that more and more we love the things that he loves and we're devoted to the things that he's devoted to. And we talked about this last week. What is the one thing that God loves? His creation. What is God most devoted to? It's his creation. What does God want more than anything? To have a relationship with his creation. There is no plan B, right? This is God's, this is God's chosen method of revealing himself to the world. It's you. And it's me. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. There is no other plan. This is it. This is God's plan. There are people in our community, there are people in our families, there are people at our schools who will spend eternity never knowing never knowing the love of their Heavenly Father. It is our job to be salt and light in their lives. God has chosen you, all right? And I'm talking to everybody, right? If you follow Jesus, God is speaking to you. Jesus' words are for you. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This is Jesus' command to us. This is his desire to us, that we would live our lives in front of of our families, in front of our community, in front of our our city, in such a way that they would want to know more about who He is, that, that, that our lives would reflect the things that He loves and the things that He's devoted to. There's no plan B. We're it. If the city of Hermiston is going to hear about Jesus, it's going to be because you tell them. 
it's going to be because I tell them. Okay? There is no, no other answer to, to, the, to the political difficulties, the divisiveness, the, the things that separate us in our culture other than the gospel, the truth about who Jesus is and why he came and what he did. And it's our job. It's our job. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So we have a couple ways. We've got a couple ways for you to engage in, in doing this. All right? And Tim talked about them already a little bit. I just want to wrap up just encouraging you to be involved in these two things. Starting tomorrow, we are beginning 10 days of prayer and fasting. All right? I, I hope that you'll join me. I, I believe that God works through the prayers of his people. And we're going to take 10 days, and, and, and it, it, so this, this, this 10 days of prayer and fasting begins with just a commitment to humbling ourselves and, and seeking God's face, right? Being good reflections. And then we're going we're gonna to take a few days to pray for our community, to pray for uh, our, our community leaders, for our, our teachers, for our, our, our law enforcement, for, for all of these, these people that lead in our community, not just our community, but our state and our nation. We're going to pray that God would heal our land. Because this is what God has called us to do, to pray, to pray for our leaders. So I, I hope that you'll enjoy me. You'll, you'll join me in this, right? So you, you can get the guide on the website. Uh, you can download it. Um, if you have a hard time getting it, man, email me. I will send it to you. Chris at newhopeon395.com. If you email me, I will send you the 10-day prayer guide. And uh, yeah, so the staff and I, we will be participating in this and uh, praying together and asking God to, to be at work in our community. And the second way is, of course, I love my city. I, I love this event because we're not asking anybody for anything. Right? We're just going to people and we're saying, hey, we're doing this because we love you. We're doing this because God values you. We're doing this because we want you to know that when God looks at you, man, <laughs> he's, he is so in love with you. And we just want to express that by serving you. We don't want anything in return. We're not, we're not even going to we're not, you know, we're not handing out tracts, right? We're not, we're not doing anything like that. We are just serving our community. We want them to know that we love them. And so I, I hope that you'll participate with us on Saturday. Go to the, go to the website, sign up. Uh, it's going to be great. We're going to do a couple fun things. We're going to go to the laundromat, and for a few hours, we're just going to pay for everybody's laundry, right? Everybody that comes in. So, like, if you're broke and you need your laundry done, go to one of the laundromats, right, this, this, uh, this next Saturday between 9 and noon. We'll pay for your laundry, right? It's going to be great. We're going we're gonna to pay for some meals at McDonald's. We're going to wash cars. We're going to do some cleanup. Uh, it's it's going to be a great day. And I, I hope the message that our community hears is that man, we love you. God loves you. And it's an opportunity for us to, to begin to even more influence, to influence our community to be salt and light. Father, thank you for our time this morning. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, what you're doing here through New Hope and, and God, through these beautiful people, uh, Father, that have decided to follow you, to give their lives uh, to you, to honor you. God, I am so grateful for them and God, I'm so excited about what the future holds and I know, God, that there are broken hurting, struggling people in our community. People that are just holding on by their fingernails. They're looking for answers. People that are desperate, desperate to find a hope. Father, we, we have that hope. You've given it to us. Father, help us to be salt and light in our community. Father, help us to, to, to have a passion. It has a passion that, God, we would have a passion that burns for our community. 
God, you've given us so much. Father, we are so blessed. I know the future that I have. I, I know that I'm loved. I know that there's nothing, nothing that can separate me from your love. And God, I want our community, I want those that are hurting and struggling this morning to know that same love, to know that same hope. God, help us to be salt and light wherever we go this week. Father, we love you. Pray it all in your son Jesus.